And welcome to Abundant Living, a casual look into the Word of God with the preaching ministry of Dr. Gary Bradley, minister of the Mayfair Church of Christ, located in Jones Valley in Huntsville. The Mayfair Church is a loving, Christ-centered church with a vision and a dream of sharing Jesus with the Tennessee Valley and the entire world. Every Sunday, Gary touches people's lives with the good news. And now he wants to share it with you one-on-one. So join us for the next few minutes as together we find the solutions to life's problems. Are you searching for those answers this morning? We believe the answers are there in God's Word and that each of us can have the abundant life God wants to give us. He reigns And now your host, Dr. Gary Bradley. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday morning. It's always my pleasure to visit with you. I hope all is well with you. We're here beginning in the month of October now. Boy, 2020 won't ever be forgotten. It's been an unbelievable year. I hope you're praying about it. I hope you're being patient. I hope you are obeying the oh the rules of, of health, you know, and that we're cooperating and that this awful, awful thing can be subdued with a vaccine and with good common sense. I hope all is well. I've had to cancel all of my uh, church growth uh, appointments for this year to next year. Uh, I just didn't want to fly. I didn't want to put the other churches in jeopardy. I had work in Texas and Oklahoma and Dallas, Dallas and Houston are the places in Texas. But anyway, uh, they're scheduled for next year, Lord willing. And I hope all this bad stuff is gone by then. But I've hoped through sometimes some bad things, we can appreciate the good things. We can appreciate the first responders. We can appreciate family. We can appreciate, every time I see one of our doctors, I, I thank him for his training and for his uh, effort to try to make a difference with us physically. And wearing that mask eight, 10 hours a day is just, I'm, I'm sure, is something we had to get used to. And now I don't know if we'll ever go anywhere without them. But uh, nevertheless, let's keep praying. Let's keep being patient. Let's keep waiting on the Lord. And I don't mean just sitting in a rocking chair waiting on the Lord. I mean working, doing what's right. And so I know you are, and I appreciate uh, the audience of Abundant Living so very much. I hear from you by email, by phone call, by comments in public. And I do appreciate that. I really do. You let me know. I don't beg for money. <laughs> the only money I ask for you from you is for Bibles in Cuba. Uh, this program, thankfully, is bought and paid for by the Mayfair Church. And uh, the purpose of this program for 40 years now has been to teach what God's Word says in the Tennessee Valley. And it's put on the Internet and it goes around the world. So it's a great privilege of mine every time we get together. I want to remind you of World Bible School. It's just uh, an excellent way of studying the Bible. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, said, how many times have you read the Bible through? Well, I really don't remember. Uh, I, I must confess I haven't done it lately, but I need to do it again because when you study the Bible, it gives you a different perspective. Uh, you forget. You forget some of the powerful examples, some of the commands, some of the reasons. And, and the, the one reason I love the Bible is because it's so brief. It gives me the bottom line. You know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. I mean, that says it all. And that's what we're talking about. If you watched our program last year, last Sunday, then you know we're talking about His love for us. But if you've not enrolled in our World Bible School, I wish you'd do that right now. I wish you'd call area code 205-881, area code 256-881-4651. 
and a machine will answer the phone, but will take your name and address because our building is closed uh, for the time being. But we'll enroll you in the World Bible School, and you do the first lesson, send it in. It'll be corrected, send it uh, number two, number three, number four, and you'll just enjoy studying the Bible. The good thing about this, folks, is you do it when you want to. You don't study when the preacher tells you to. <laughs> you study when you want to. It may be early in the morning. It may be at noon. It may be late. It may be at night when uh, I can't think of a better way to go to sleep than having spent uh, can, uh, whatever time you can in God's Word. It'll give you some peace of mind that you were not aware of, I'm sure. Uh, the Bible in Philippians, she talks about the peace of Christ that passeth all understanding. Uh, you can't describe it. It's indescribable. It's not the peace the world knows. It's the peace that we know. Let me review for just a moment because some of you may be viewing for the first time. We're right in the middle of something that has meant more to me, I guess, through all these years, it's a, it's a principle that I learned uh, years ago when I was in college. We had one of our great speakers uh, talking about something he experienced years ago when he would ride with a country doctor from farm to farm in Walker County. And he would ride from farm to farm, checking on the sick people, giving shots to the children if they needed or whatever. And the preacher would ride with him because he would get to see these people as well, and he would get to read the Bible to them, and he would get to pray with them. And so you had a wonderful combination there. And one day, the doctor had been troubled because he'd been reading the crucifixion. And when a doctor reads a crucifixion, he sees things that nobody else does. I have a copy in my office of a paper that's about this thick that is the doctor's account of the crucifixion. And um, I want you to know that I don't read that very often. It is the most disturbing um, account I have ever read of what happens when someone was crucified. And so you can imagine this doctor's apprehension. You can imagine his, I don't know, his frustration over, he asked the question, he said, Preacher, why did Jesus have to die? Why did he have to die like he did? What if he had lived 30, 40 or 50 or 60 years? Look at all the good he could have done. And so he talked about that a while. Then the preacher answered him by saying that the Lord came to die. And that's hard for us to understand because we've never had anybody else in our history, in the history of the world to do that, who came for the purpose of dying. Well, we talked about two points and then I want to move on. Number one, we said it was the eternal purpose of God. It wasn't something that just happened overnight. It wasn't something that wasn't planned. The Lord prayed in the garden that this cup pass from me. Not my will, but thine be done. Oh, how many times can we say that? How many times do we have to say that when we are faced with a situation that we don't think we can, we can have the strength to stand up to? Uh, Father, don't let this happen. Don't let this happen. But if it does, give me the strength to deal with it. Wow, what a statement. Let thy will be done. You know the difference between heaven and earth? In heaven, the will of God is done completely. On earth, the will of man is done completely. That's a big difference, isn't it? And, and talking with people about becoming a Christian, I think that's a, the, one of the most difficult things to deal with is try to get them to change their agenda from what they want to do to what the Lord wants them to do. And, and when you do that, I, I think we're getting pretty close to 
where the Lord wants us to be. And so the Lord came in order to fulfill the eternal purpose. Number two, he came to do away with the old law. And that is, Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 17, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He came to fulfill the law. Now that law's been done away, and when he came, he, read the Sermon on the Mount. Read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And notice the differences, uh, the way the Lord talked about the way we are to live now. He said, if your enemy hunger, give him to eat. If he's thirsty, give him to drink. If he takes you to court and he takes your coat, give him your cloak also. I, I, I think really the Sermon on the Mount is the most uh, complete, yet oftentimes disturbing the way we think today, a passage of Scripture in the Bible. He talked about every aspect of life. He talked about being humble. <laughs> he talked about mourning. He talked about thirsting after righteousness. He talked about being a light. And uh, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And uh, he said, do good things that others may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. What are we are to do? We are to live in such a way that we give God the glory. Well, you know, you've heard me say one of my favorite passages is <laughs> what we're doing. Uh, James chapter 4, he says, Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we'll go in a certain city, we'll spend a year there. I told you that I'd changed a lot of my church growth appointments to next year. I may not go. And that's what James says, For what is your life? It's even as a vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes away. The other morning we got up real early to go hunting. And we were over in Paint Rock, and there was a vapor, there was a cloud down in the valley over the Paint Rock River. And I, I thought of that verse when I saw that. And then as we got into the woods, uh, the vapor, when the sun came up, the vapor was gone. He said, that's what life is about. Life is a vapor that appears for a little while, then you ought to say. Here's a kicker. But the Lord says, but you ought to say, if the Lord wills. Oh, so I ought to say, if the Lord wills, I'll go to all these churches next year. That's right. Why? Because he's in charge. I'm not. And, and when we can... When we can uh, comprehend that, I think we will be better people. So the Lord took away the old law. Number three, let's get to let's get to the one that really is so meaningful. The Lord not only came to full to uh, have the uh, purpose of God fulfilled the old law, but He came to take away our sins. Read First Corinthians chapter fifteen. He says, the gospel that I preached unto you, wherein you stand, if you hold fast that which I've committed unto you. Listen to this. How Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that you were buried with him in baptism, and that you were raised to walk in newness of life. See, that's the gospel. Uh, when I go to, if I please pray for the people in Cuba. When I go back to Cuba, you know, I go in for one thing, for one purpose. I, I, can't, I can't go in for any other purpose. They won't let me in. But for all these years, since 1994, I've gone just to preach the gospel in a communist country. And I didn't try to overthrow the government. It wouldn't have, I couldn't anyway. But all I did was preach Christ. And Christ is, is the answer to the questions of life. Christ is the answer to what are you going to do about life? 
of what did he say in Philippians 1.21? He said, for me to live is Christ. For a lot of people, for me to live is work. And I'm all for working, but it has its place. For me to live is family. Family is wonderful. But families have a way of going their separate ways. Uh, families are not with us all the time. For me to live is to have a good time. Really? Paul says, for me to live is Christ. That's all. No big deal. Won't be on the news. It won't be in the paper. It's just day-to-day -day living for the Lord. If I were arrested and taken to court to prove Christianity, I would take the lives of the people that I know. I would take people with me and I would say, as far as I can tell as a human being, this person and this person and this person does their dead level best to live for the Lord. And I, and I think that's, it's, it's like 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter's talking about a sweet lady that's a Christian that's married to a man who's not a Christian. And, and, and Peter said he won't be gained by the word. He won't go to church. You know, you can't preach to him. And he's basically saying the, the only way you're going to convert him is by living it in front of him. Wow. And you live it in front of him when you are so grateful for the fact that Christ has died for your sins. In um, so many of the passages in, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, for he is the propitiation. Boy, that's a jawbreaker, isn't it? For he is a propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Well, when you become a Christian, like you described in Romans uh, chapter 15 and in Romans chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and Romans chapter 6, that we're buried with him in baptism, then we're raised to walk in newness of life. Well, what if you do if you sin then? Well, now you're in a relationship to do what 1 John chapter 7 and 9 says, confess your sins and he's faithful to forgive us. Do you have to be baptized again? Of course not. When you're baptized into Christ, you're in that relationship with Christ. And he's your father and you're his son. You have put him on. Don't overlook those little prepositions in Christ Jesus. Like Ephesians 1.3. All spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus. Well, if they're in Christ, they're not anywhere else. And so that's a blessing. So it is in his eternal purpose. He takes away the old law for the forgiveness of our sins. Look at the examples in the book of Acts when the question was asked and answered, what must I do to be saved? You begin in Acts 2. The people on Pentecost, they were there for a Jewish holiday. The Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles. They began to preach. Peter got up and he ate their lunch. I mean, he let them have it. Ye men of Israel, uh, ye have crucified with wicked hands the Son of God. And this same Jesus whom ye hath crucified, this same troublemaker that you thought, has become both Lord and Christ. Wow. Verse 36, And they, they were cut to the heart and cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 37, verse 38, Repent, be baptized, every one of you. Really? For the forgiveness of your sins and... A second blessing is you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then they that gladly received his word. Oh, that's a good word, isn't it? They that were happy to hear 
that my sins have been forgiven. My sins are washed away in the blood of the Lamb. And they that gladly received his word were baptized in that day about 3,000 souls. And then in verse 47, and the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. And so we'll get to that point in a minute. And so then Christ died for our sins. You know, my mother and daddy loved me. My daddy was a welder. I've told you that before. During the war, he made ships with all those other good men and women in Pensacola, Florida. And the torches would just blind him. And I would meet him at the road when he would get out of the ride. We didn't have a car then. And he would get out of the car and I'd meet him at the road and take him by the hand and lead him home because his eyes were just blistered, almost closed. My dad loved me. My mama loved me. But they couldn't forgive my sins. They couldn't. They could tra treat me, you know, they fed me, they clothed me, they educated me, they loved me, they left uh, me a great heritage as far as the church is concerned, but only Jesus can forgive my sins. Acts 4.12, there's none other, none other name given among men whereby you must be saved. John 14.6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Regardless of what your kids are being taught at school, regardless of what they hear on the media, regardless of what they hear on the street, Jesus is still the only way. And it, I, I don't want to get into that because it's so upsetting, but I never thought I'd live that long that people would say openly and proudly that there are many ways to heaven and Jesus is the only one. I never, ever thought that would happen, but it is every day. And so we've got a major job on our hands, and that is to present Jesus who he really is. You know, I was reading uh, in the book of Matthew chapter 20 when Jesus encountered two blind men and uh, th they were standing on the side of the road. I can't imagine being blind back then. Uh, there was no help. There was no braille. There was, there, there, was no, there was no assistance. If you were blind back then, uh, life was just so awful. And so they cried out and they, they heard Jesus coming and they said, Lord, have mercy on us. And some of the people standing around said, y'all be quiet, y'all leave them alone. And they said it again, Lord, have mercy on us. And Jesus stopped and he turned to them and, and he said, what do you want me to do? I've always thought that was so interesting. Did Jesus know they were blind? Of course he did. Uh, what do you, you want money? You want clothes? You want food? What do you want, what do you want me to do? And one of the men said, Lord, give us our sight. Open our eyes. Years ago, I was reading about two little boys down in Talladega, Alabama. In a, in a blind school. And I don't know how truthful it is, but it's a powerful story. And they were talking, and one of them said, you know, if you could wish for anything in the world, what would you wish for? He said, um, I believe I'd wish for a C&I dog, the best C&I dog in the world. And the other boy said, well, that, that's interesting. He said, what would you wish for? He said, I'd wish for my eyes. Mm. Wow. We just fail to remember that the Lord gave us our eyes, not physically, but spiritually. He gave us our eyes that we might really, really see that he died for our sins, and that he 
when he died, he purchased the church. This is what Paul, I didn't say that, Paul did, Acts 20 and 28. Feed the church of the Lord, which he purchased with his own blood, period. Talking to elders, talking to the leaders of the church, you men need to feed God's people because he, it's important enough that it would require the blood of Christ. But I've got to get to the last point because it's, it obviously is, speaks for itself, and that is the reason Christ died was to show his great love for mankind. And now I go back to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. The word so there is an adverb of degree. And in the English, see, we're handicapped. Uh, that's the only word we've got. Uh, I love you. Well, how much? Well, I just love you so much. Well, how much? Well, just so much. See, we, we've got a handy. We've got a problem there in our English, but in the Greek, boy, it is so very powerful. I love you more than anything else in the world. That He gave His only begotten Son, the only one He had. As I said two weeks ago, a week ago, we might think that God looked all over heaven for a suitable sacrifice, but none would do except his son. Suppose he had sent an angel. Suppose he had sent Gabriel. And we would have said, that's, that's awfully, uh, that's awfully uh, thoughtful of, great, of, of Gabriel to be willing to die. He sent his own. I've got two sons. And both of them are preachers. But I don't know that I would give up. I wouldn't want to give up either one of them for anybody. Do I love other people that much? Not as much as the Lord did. Well, let's close with this verse. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. It's one of my favorites. God demonstrated to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's it. No fanfare. That's it. He demonstrated. That's what I like. I like a demonstration. You know, I like for you to show me. Show me how it works. Don't just tell me. Don't just write it on paper. Show me how it works. And he did on Calvary when he shed his blood for our sins. The sun refused to shine. The veil, the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. And the soldier standing there, the soldier, the centurion, the, the captain, who was there to make sure the Roman law was not broken, said, truly, this was the Son of God. Wow. Until next week, may God bless you. Abundant Living, a ministry of the Mayfair Church of Christ. A place where children are loved, where families are strengthened, where teens learn to serve, and grandparents are special. Mayfair, truly a family place for all ages. The Mayfair Church of Christ, we're saving a special place for you. Blessed be the Lord God.